What is going on, sports fam? It's your favorite history teacher, Mr. Parker Ainsworth, here another edition of FN Sports, the podcast where teachers grade sports biggest issues. And today, one issue I want to resolve a little bit is talking some about the big announcement we had last week, our, what we're calling new course of sorts. If you were paying attention to the episode that came out, the midterm episode from Wednesday, I guess really went live Thursday morning, or if you are finding us now on YouTube via the 6 pack coverage network or if you just saw our post on social media or like wondering what the heck is that yes we are going to be live through another outlet starting last week fn sports will be brought to you to youtube via the six pack coverage network six pack coverage is hitting six different areas sports food travel fitness and entertainment the six pack coverage network is brought to you by Andrew Grayson and Albert Hainsworth. Yes, that same Albert Hainsworth you might remember from the University of Tennessee or the Tennessee Titans or the Washington, I guess now, football team. And so we're now going to be available on YouTube through their network. We'll still be brought to you on all of your audio mediums through the Belly Up Sports Podcast Network. That's two different networks. We're doing a little bit of two-dip, two-stepping, but... That's more ways for you to find us and get access to all the content we know you love. So if you're coming over from Belly Up Sports and finding us on YouTube, welcome. And if you're with Six Pack Coverage and are new to FN Sports, we also want to say welcome to class. This is the podcast where teachers grade sports' biggest issues. But first, let's dive in with some gold stars and detentions. First gold star is sports adjacent. Uh, maybe because you play this person's music before sports games we're gonna give a gold star to megan the stallion for amongst her various accolades in music managing to also graduate from texas southern university last weekend yes texas southern tsu congrats to megan the stallion on all of you're obviously representing houston very well out there with all your musical awards and things like that but also finishing that degree kids school still counts second gold star is going to go to the oklahoma city thunder the Oklahoma City Thunder invited two survivors of the Tulsa Race Massacre from 1921. 107-year-old Viola Fletcher and 100-year-old Hughes Van Ellis, their siblings. Uh, congrats to them, for, first of all, making it this long. Congrats to them for making it to their first NBA game in Oklahoma City. And gold stars the Oklahoma City Thunder for having and showcasing these two survivors of not so distant history, but history we need to remember nonetheless. It was a great, great moment. It was very cool to see the Oklahoma City Thunder crowd welcome them with a standing ovation. Shoutouts to OKC. Third gold star is going to go to Gary Bird. Oh, I mean, his name is Garrison Matthews. If you have not been paying attention, this two-way contract call-up for the Houston Rockets from Actually, Tennessee, so if you're coming into us from six-pack coverage with a lot of Tennessee ties, you might remember the name from Lipscomb University, was called up to the NBA after being undrafted originally by, I believe, the Washington Wizards, did some two-way contract back and forth with them, then after being cut by a couple people, has made his way to the Houston Rockets after originally being signed to play with the RGV Vipers. He has worked his way into the starting lineup, is shooting well over 40% at one point, was shooting six or more threes every game, and shooting 49% or better on those six or more attempts. He's also a hustle type player that is tenacious on defense, long, tough, diving on the floor for loose balls. I think the most memorable defensive play from him is a tie between both in the Brooklyn game, I should say, but a tie between either. While James Harden is letting the ball roll, trying to like not spin the clock, Gary Bird dives on the floor to go get the loose ball, and underneath Harden's legs is on top of the basketball, or there was also the steal and breakaway dunk to seal that game a few plays later. Shout out to Garrison Matthews, the Houston Rockets gold star. Always like to see guys making the most of their call-ups, especially undrafted free agent type guys making the most of the call-ups from the two-way contract it feels like a matter of days or weeks before he's officially converted into an nba deal last gold star is going to go to charles mcdonald for i think the best take after last monday's new england 
versus Buffalo game. For those who don't remember that game, because it's been over a week now, that game was played in like a bajillion mile an hour winds. For some reason, Buffalo decided to try and pass the ball a lot. And, you know, brilliant that Bill Belichick is. He decided not to try to pass the ball a lot. He, he, he stuck with just passing the ball three times, one of which was behind the line of scrimmage. And the New England Patriots ended up winning the game and a lot of hoopla around that. The Charles McDonald take was as simple as maybe we shouldn't draw very big conclusions from a game in which one of the quarterbacks threw the ball three times because a lot of people were coming out of the game like, oh, Mac Jones is a leader. Or, oh, Bill Belichick is the go. Or, oh, da, da, da. And like, honestly, that game was so out there and weird I think it's fair to say that you can't judge the New England Patriots, their roster, their coach, or the Bills roster, their players, their coach, off such a weird anomaly of a game. Shout out to Charles McDonald's for writing that down and putting it on Twitter. That's a, he's a great follow if you're into the NFL at all. Uh, he, he always puts things in good perspective, but he was the only guy I saw making that kind of statement. Uh, I guess Mina Kimes mentioned that you shouldn't, you know, count wins as a quarterback stat, and that was a good example of it. But that still seems to be fairly one side on the issue, and McDonald's like, no, 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 this is a game that should not be deciding either side of the issue. So shout out to Charles McDonald. <laughs> Detention to the University of Miami, but not for the hiring process that brought them Mario Cristobal. If you have not been paying attention, the University of Miami is bringing in or former Oregon head coach Mario Cristobal to replace... Manny Diaz down there in South Beach. Now, Mario Cristobal is very deeply tied and connected to Miami. It is a homecoming of sorts. But I don't like that Miami asks reporters to not ask questions about the hiring process of Mario Cristobal. There seems to be this big cover-up of sorts in, in trying to make sure people don't understand what they did in hiring him because they hired him while they still technically were paying Manny Diaz. And while that is icky in a number of different ways while that is questionable in a number of different ways it's not abnormal for power five college football we just saw this happen with my beloved longhorns last year in the process of bringing in steve sarkeesian and getting rid of tom herman tom herman was still on staff when all the rumors and contracts and numbers and those kind of were coming out about sarkeesian like this happens fairly frequently in major college football it's happened again to my Longhorns like th three times in the last 10 years. Like this happens over and over again. If Miami wants to get into that game, they need to stop acting like they can't talk about that happening. That's a very commonplace thing. And so just admit what you did. You did what everyone else is doing. Now, if you want to talk about why everyone else shouldn't be doing that, maybe that's a different conversation. But I don't like the fact you're trying to cover up what you do. So detention to Miami. Just be honest about what happened. Detention to Enos Cantor Freedom. Now, there are some stuff Enos Cantor has done in the last few years being a freedom fighter across the United States that I don't necessarily disagree with. There are some things that he does done that I do disagree with. I'm not really going to talk about the grandiose scheme of Enos Cantor Freedom and all the different things he has and hasn't done. I do think he is really enjoying his time in the limelight as it currently stands. And this detention is for using that time in the limelight to go after one Jeremy Lin. Jeremy Lin, for those of you that don't remember Lin Sanity or maybe you're too young to remember Lin Sanity or are like, oh my God, Lin Sanity is coming back. No, what's happening is Enos Cantor Freedom took his time out on Twitter to call out Jeremy Lin, born in Palo Alto, California, went to high school in Palo Alto, and then went across country to Harvard for college before making his own NBA run who has played a little bit of professionally in China since his NBA dreams have squandered. Also, I should point out, NBA champion with the Toronto Raptors, but that's not here or there. Enos Cantor went on a rant, diatribe, soapbox, anyway, asking Jeremy Lin why he isn't standing up to China and asking Jeremy Lin why he's not vocal and outspoken, these kind of things about the various human rights violations that China has committed in the last, I don't know, bajillion years. But I, what I really think is awkward is that that was tweeted from an iPhone, right? Like, where does Enos Cantor get to sit on his high horse to talk to some Chinese American in Palo Alto, right, from Palo Alto, right, who has lived his entire adult life, or the majority of his adult life, I guess you should say, because he's played some overseas, with this guy that has lived primarily in the United States and is very, very American. He's a Chinese American. I don't mean to say that he's not the child of immigrants and those kinds of things, but to act like he needs to be taking on this fight against his ancestral land while Enos Cantor can sit here and use a device that was made in China to tweet about it? 
right? Like, I get that Enos Cantor no longer wears Nikes because he's going to sit on his high horse and tell LeBron and all of them all the things that they've done wrong. But, like, tweeted from iPhone? Really? That's what we're doing this for? Like, you you, you can't go somewhere else with that? You can't find some of the... I mean, anyway, I, attention to Enos Cantor. There's a number of things I think that he's doing to absorb and stay in the limelight a little bit longer than he might have otherwise. And I don't even necessarily mean to say that we shouldn't be pointing out things that China has done wrong, right? We can look at what they've done with Ping Shui. We look at the issues coming up with the upcoming Olympics and, and even go back to the 08 Olympics and all stuff in between. I'm not saying he doesn't bring up valid points, but to try and shoulder that on the, you know, this Chinese American who was born in Palo Alto feels very, very awkward and a tinge, we'll use the word icky, I guess, because he did just get 280 characters and maybe he needs to explain himself further. But putting that all on Jeremy Lin feels just not fair. And so detention Dean Scanter, freedom. Sticking in the NBA, our last detention is going to go to the NBA for fining Kevin Durant for talking back to a fan while the ball was being dribbled to court. So if you haven't seen this clip yet, Kevin Durant got a $25,000 fine for responding to trash talk coming from the front row, still playing the game. Still passing and dribbling the ball, still very active. It didn't detract from the game at all, but it was caught on cell phone camera. That cell phone camera video went viral because he did respond, hate your back, use some four-letter words, and so on, blah, blah, blah. And as it goes, he gets a $25,000 fine. Now, I understand Durant has made a lot of money, and frankly, he's made a lot of money that people probably don't intuitively think of through things like 35 Ventures because he is very, very well invested with his money. That's part of the reason he wanted to get from the Bay Area to Brooklyn is to continue to dive into those different things in the offseason. But that all aside, the fact that a front row seat or a person in a front row seat can talk trash to Kevin, but Kevin cannot respond. He's supposed to be holier than that. Like that brings back the entire fan scenarios we're seeing at the start of last playoffs when people were dumping popcorn and Russell Westbrook and, and, you know, throwing slurs and spitting on Trey Young and all the, like, these are human beings. They're going to respond if you are within 10 feet of them and say something derogatory, negative, or talk trash to them. They're allowed to respond. And you know what? That's the fun of it. Everyone remembers when Reggie Miller and Spike Lee went back and forth between Indiana and New York. But what people don't seem to like understand is that Spike Lee is a celebrity, sure, but he was just a fan like these other per people talking trash. Reggie Miller talked trash back. That was a great NBA moment, one we still celebrate as NBA history and lore. And now we're going to throw a fine at Kevin Durant for talking? Talking back? Like, he didn't stop the game to talk back. The ball, so he's walking the ball up the court. I, I just don't get that. Detention to the NBA on that fine. If you want to celebrate things like Reggie Miller, you need to allow the next moment like that to happen. All right, so for those that are new to the program here, we're going to dive into a few different theses. We're going to grade theses across the lands across the professional sports, I guess I say professional, one from college sports, uh, landscape, and look at different topics and things like that. First, we're going to give you the thesis, give it a grade, and explain why we do that. So without further ado, let's dive in. <laughs> All right, so our first thesis of the week reads, Bryce Young, the Alabama quarterback, should be able to go pro after this season. Now, Bryce Young just won the Heisman. His name is kind of in the news, especially with Alabama being number one heading into the college football playoff. And I'm going to give that thesis an A. As I stare at it, I, I don't see a whole lot of flaws. I guess there's like one thing keeping it from being an A+. Plus, but I'm going to give that thesis an A. All right, so the thesis reads that Bryce Young should be able to go straight to the NFL after this season. So Bryce Young is a 20-year-old sophomore from modern day that has been in Alabama for two years. He's just started this season. I should point out he didn't start last year with Mac Jones there. On this season, he's thrown for 4,300 yards, 68% completions, 43 touchdowns, just four picks. That's a pretty high quarterback rating at 175.5 if you're doing the math at home. Also worth pointing out, he's got three rushing touchdowns. You're trying to add stuff up. Biggest, I think, reason he'd be in the news right now, why this thesis would pop up, is that he just won the Heisman over the weekend. becoming the first, He was the first Alabama quarterback to win that award. Again, Alabama, you think of all the historically great running backs. They just had 
Devontae Smith last year as a, as a wide receiver, but he's the first Alabama quarterback to win that award, which is interesting. We look at they have three current NFL starting quarterbacks that are relatively young that he's the first one to do it out of any of those guys is impressive. I see this as a number of different things. One, I don't know why any professional, like as a just general workplace thing, right? How can any of these workplaces say, actually, you need to be above this age to come to work here? Like that's, once you're over 18, I don't really understand how they're able to draw that line. More generally speaking, I understand that like, these workplaces function much different than like the common workplace and like the NFL has like a monopoly on American pro football and those kinds of things. They could kind of dictate the rules and regulations. But I will say that in a broad sense, I don't like that any of these leagues have that rule. Like should we go straight? If you really want to go straight to high school into Hollywood, you can go try and work in Hollywood. If you really want to go straight to high school and work, try and work at, you know, Microsoft, you can go try and work at Microsoft. They can tell you, no, they can decline you, but you can go try. I don't know why that isn't allowed at these other workplaces just because they're professional sports. It feels weirdly like in football, you're trying to protect the kids from themselves. And I mean, I know that not many kids would try and make that leap, but Adrian Peterson probably lost money by going to college, right? Like you could argue Derek Henry lost money by going to college. You could argue like a handful of guys, just because you get more wear and tear on your tires, not even saying that have better pro careers, but that that's four years of earnings at the NFL level that they don't have. And so I think that while those guys are obviously few and far between and very rare, Bryce Young coming back to college next year feels kind of silly. I mean, what else does he really have? to prove that the number one seed going to the college football playoff, they get Cincinnati in the first round. And, you know, as much as I want to see a Cincinnati pull off the upset, because frankly, that's a lot of fun and be great to see a group five team win the whole thing and blah, blah, blah. They're very heavily favored. I mean, at the time of recording this, Alabama is a 14 point favorite on my bookie to beat Cincinnati. And then the winner, I guess, would be the winner of George. They, if they win, they'd play the winner of Georgia and Michigan. Uh, Georgia's favorite in that game by seven and a half points. And we saw what Alabama did to Georgia. Just so we like theoretically, this ought to play out without any craziness. One game sample size, you could have craziness, but he should end up being a national champion in his first year as a starter. We've noted since the beginning of the season that reports were indicating that as soon as the NIL deal got signed, he was able to make up to in somewhere in the seven figure range as the Alabama quarterback before he even started a game. He just won the Heisman. I don't know what's left. I also look at this year's college quarterback class as far as guys going to the NFL. And Kenny Pickett is considered the you know on profootballnetwork.com and on a couple of others as the top quarterback prospect. Things like, you know, slight measurements here or there are maybe gonna hurt him. But on the whole, he's considered this like gamer that you got to have. And blah, blah, blah. He's going to be the top quarterback off the board. You know, you might like the guy from Ole Miss, Matt Coral. Uh, you might like, I don't know, Sam Howell in North Carolina, I guess, was a big name last summer and might have fallen back a couple of spots. But we just determined Bryce Young was better than those guys. And if he's better than those guys right now, why is he waiting to make the big checks until next year? summer right like if, if he is good enough right now and we've just determined that i don't know why he should have to wait i don't i don't, I don't get it i don't understand why any rational person would think that now i didn't quite give it an a plus because i don't think that's just like this like broad swathing statement for maybe everyone right and i would t also totally get how if they lose to cincinnati he wants to come back and seek vengeance and and do the right thing and and you know, come up, go, leave with an undefeated title, right? They didn't go undefeated this year. They did lose to Texas A&M earlier this season. I also think it's worth pointing out, like I obviously think of this game a lot because I'm a Texas fan, but we remember that the USC team with two Heisman winners did not win the national title. Vince Young did, right? He did not win the Heisman that year and he went up win the national title. And so I guess theoretically, I don't want to just hand the national title to Bryce Young, but if he were to win it, I don't know what else he would, come back and do i also think it's worth pointing out that he's already a semi quasi professional so if you read Mirren fader's piece for the ringer about how his day is structured he's already functioning like a minor league professional because he's scheduling in online classes and things like that but he is 
at the facility all day long putting work, 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 work. He is a workhorse. He's a workaholic. He cannot get enough. He gets always in the film room, always getting his body rehabbed, always in the weight room, always out working out, always outside throwing. He'll be inside diagramming stuff up with his teammates. And all of that work is at a professional level. And if he's working at a professional level, I get he's making NIL money. I get that that's seven figures. I get that that's compensation of sorts. But what I will say is, is none of that legally has Alabama in the from line of the check. And I think it's time for this guy to carry over and start getting checks from where he's playing. I mean, he can keep all the deals he's making through NIL as a professional football player. All of those car, car wash deals and sneaker sponsorships and wear our wristbands or eat at our restaurant, be on our billboard. He can also do those as a pro. Like, like he, he doesn't have to turn those down just because he's going to the league and making money from whoever has the number one pick when the season's all done. It, you know, if the Jets end up with the number one pick, I don't know if he goes there. If he goes to Houston, that feels like a dumpster fire, but I, I guess they will need a quarterback because it feels like Deshaun Watson thinks over. I, anyway, without getting too far down the road there, Bryce Young deserves a shot to go be a professional. He's been a professional for what feels like at a year. I guess it's been a few months, but it's he's been professional-esque for a year. He's done, if he wins the national title, all he needs to do in college, and he's showed it on the field. I mean, we, we have those moments. We have the Auburn game. We have the Florida game. We have these close games, and while I can sit here and talk about last week how those aren't necessarily the impressive wins that we wanted them to be, right? that maybe those might not be as big and strong wins as we wanted them to be. And I had this problem with multiple SEC teams being in the Final Four and whatever. I will say that there is no issue with Bryce Young. Bryce Young is very much a pro and very much deserves a shot to go pro. So A to this thesis, uplift the rule, let the guy jump. He's ready. It's time to start letting these guys in and let them make their money. <laughs> Our second thesis of the day reads, the 12 and 15 Knicks are in trouble. I think I'm also going to give that an A-, uh, not quite as high as the last one, but man, that feels strong. All right, so the thesis read, the 12 and 15 New York Knicks are in trouble. It's worth pointing out the Knicks are currently 12th in the East out of just 15 teams. I am, again, high on this thesis. I do think the New York Knicks are in trouble. So let's break down why. First of all, we talked about in our NBA season preview that we did back with Jade. It's been a few weeks now at that point, but back with Jade before the season started, that the Knicks could be better without having a better record or better seeding in this playoff series or in this spring and summer's playoffs because they overachieved so much last season, right? And opening the year, it kind of felt like they were picking up from where they left off. They won five of their first six games. They were, was it 10 and eight at Thanksgiving? It felt like they were kind of going to be in that same middle of the playoff pack at the end of this season as they were last season. However, it's worth pointing off that they've lost six of their last seven. They're relying on a handful of call-ups. I mean, even in the loss to Milwaukee on Sunday, the day we're recording this, you know, my man Quentin Grimes to come up with 27 and a, like seven or seven big threes. Uh, and, and I guess that you could theoretically say like, oh, that's a young guy to build on. That's a young guy to do this. That's a young guy to do that. But at, at some level, even with just Julius Randle and RJ Barrett, and the young picks they've invested in guys like Obi Toppin or Emmanuel Quigley or, or whatever, you'd hope that, you know, adding Kimba Walker to the mix would keep them in the playoffs. Like, this this wouldn't be the kind of thing that you'd think would take them out, especially with how well Fournier played uh, Fournier played on the, on the way out of the season last year. I just, I look at this team, and I'm like, man, I didn't expect them to be blowing the doors off everyone, but I, I thought they'd be above 500. You know, I, I, I guess that's part of my problem here is, Obviously, the Nets are the top of the conference. The Bucks are the top of the conference. The Bulls have... They surprised me, although I don't guess they surprised everyone. Launched their way to the top of the conference. The Heat are good. The Cavs are good and fun. If you're not watching the Cavs, you really, really should. Lots of fun stuff there with Mobley and Garland and Sexton when he's back healthy. And Jared Allen, those guys are a lot of fun. But someone had to fall. And the team has been the Knicks. 
worth pointing out that the Celtics have also taken a step backwards, aren't the 10 seed, 13 and 14. The Hawks have also taken a step backward, are just 500 themselves at the 9 seed. And so some of this may shake out differently as the year goes on. The issue with the Knicks to me is that I don't see Thibodeau's teams doing that. Because of the style of play Thibodeau has, you typically start the year strong because you're hyper-focused on defending, and then you eventually run out of gas because he plays everyone so many minutes that it's just wear and tear and takes you down. This year, only Julius Randle is going more than 32 minutes a game, which is relatively low for what Thibodeau likes to do. I will say RJ Barrett also has you know 31.4 minutes per game. But I think it's interesting to look at them as like, man, what's going on? Because they've got, you know, RJ Barrett on health and safety protocol as of fairly recently, but that that doesn't account for all the stuff that's going on on their wins and losses, right? Obi Toppin, I guess, missed the Milwaukee game, but that doesn't count for all of their losses. I would even argue in looking at their schedule that they necessarily had a super rough stretch. I mean, they lost to Milwaukee, good team, but they lost to Toronto, who's like with them on the outside looking in the playoffs. They lost to Indiana, who we just heard in a Shams bomb this week is looking to blow their team up, right? They beat San Antonio. They lost to Atlanta, or they lost to Chicago, right? Good team, whatever. They But they've also lost to Charlotte. They've also lost to Cleveland, lost to Indiana earlier this season. Uh, I, they lost one on a, you know, two out of three days with Orlando, which was interesting too. I... I just look at them like, man, they're in trouble, especially if you look at their stuff between now and the new year. You know, if they if they weren't below 500 right now, like the Knicks of last spring, I'd probably say, man, they could probably go 500 between now and the new year. But now it's like, are they going to beat Golden State? Are they going to beat Boston? Boston? Can they beat Washington? Even like Minnesota, I'm like, oh, man, like Carlton Towns give him his kind of game and, and really, like, you know, rub them out the wrong way at... I don't know. And then once you get into the new year, they've struggled against Indiana. They play them on the fourth. They got Boston a pair of games, right? They go to Dallas and Luka in the uh, middle of January. I, I just, I guess I worry about them on the whole because I don't feel like they've got easy stretches of schedule coming up. When you factor in the fact that they've already lost to several of these teams that should have been more like cakewalks. Now, I will say that perhaps this is youth right they've got eight players 23 and under okay they had a great season last year and all of new york was patting them on the back and basketball is fun when the knicks are good and so in some sense the entire nba stratosphere was patting them on the back for having a better than anyone would have thought season last year so maybe all of these young guys again eight guys 23 and under maybe all these guys are like, oh man, we're so good, and da da da. And they came to the season like, whoa, now I have the target on our back a little bit. I don't think Derrick Rose did that. I don't think Kimball Walker did that. I don't think Julius Randle did that. I don't think Evan Fournier did that. But like, Obi Toppin, maybe. Kevin Knox, maybe. RJ Barrett, Manuel Quigley, even guys that are new there like Quentin Grimes, Jericho Sims, maybe. You know, I, I, I guess my, my worry is how did they get here? At this current, I would have thought they'd be a few games over 500 at this point and peter out towards the end of the season. The interesting thing in like watching them play is that they seem to be bleeding points in a way I don't associate with Thibodeau's teams. And a way to articulate that in stats would be that they're playing 96.2 possessions per game, which is 24th in the league. It's relatively speaking very slow. They're also giving a defensive rating of 110.6 up meaning they're allowing 110 points per 100 possessions. And that's also in the bottom third of the league. And while I can understand being slow because you're playing at a Thibodeau pace on offense, I can't understand giving up that many points per 100 possessions as a Thibodeau defense. And that that's worrisome. I, I guess you could look at that like Nerland Dewell has only been around for 12 games this season or that like Mitchell Robinson's played in you know, 23 out of the, what is it? 26 games and so maybe some of those you win if you have some of those bigger bodies in to help defend the rim or or maybe something's going on there it certainly feels like julius randall is getting to his spots offensively still uh, he's still around i think he's just under 20 yeah just under 20 points per game 
Uh, he's still getting 10 rebounds a game. Like Julius is still being Julius. And so he still looks like he should have earned that most improved player award last year. Like, I, don't, I don't think those are missing. I just don't get where the Knicks sit currently. And again, Thibodeau teams, I don't expect to be playing better in March and April. Obviously, they dial it up because of defense and the intensity of playoffs. But March and April are not really Thibodeau's months. And if we're already having questions and worries about the Knicks in December, they could have a real problem on their hands come February, March, April. Okay, Parker. So the thesis statement for this commercial is James Harden has the best beard in sports. What do you think about that thesis statement? Oh, I give it an A. You know, as a Houston guy, we we seem to have an affinity for our beards between guys like him, Dallas Keiko, lots of big beards in the Houston area. What do you think about the thesis? So I'm a Jets fan, and I absolutely love the beard that Ryan Fitzpatrick has. So maybe I would give Ryan Fitzpatrick the nod over James Harden. But... You're talking to a couple of bearded teachers, and we know a thing or two about making sure that you maintain that mane. So check out the beard struggle. The beard struggle, they make oils, they make balms, they even have this heated comb to make sure that you get your beard straight so that you're looking fresh. I know I've really enjoyed using the oil they make for my quarantine beard of sorts. It's nice and long these days, but it'll <laughs> keep it nice and healthy and hydrated. And if you're listening to our show, you can use FN Sports 15 and get 15% off your oils, your bombs, your shampoos, conditioners, whatever you need to use to keep your beard looking healthy. Absolutely. Check out the beard struggle at thebeardstruggle.com. Whether you're just starting to grow or you have a luscious mane already, the beard struggle's got all the products that you need. The beard struggle, feast your face. All right, our third thesis reads. The Baylor Bears will win another NCAA men's basketball title this season. And call me Easy A Ainsworth, but man, I'm giving this one a high grade as well. I'm going to sit at an A minus, giving the Baylor Bears a very, very clear favorite in my eyes to win another basketball championship. All right, so I gave the thesis an A minus. The Baylor Bears will win another NCAA men's title this season. This is going to win the heels of an absolute throttling of Villanova on Sunday. Again, the Baylor Bears won 57 to 36. And yes, I know the Baylor Bears lost four of their starters from last season, including three of their top scores from last season. But culture tends to be king in college basketball. And Scott Drew has really set up this culture of we play nine or ten guys. They all fly around. They all scrap. They all dive on the floor. They all take charges. They all defend. Right? They all attack the basket and put you in predicaments on offense. Like, this is an aggressive basketball program that is truly relentless and a ton of fun, frankly, to watch. I... I, I would encourage you as a basketball person to go watch Scott Drew's Baylor Bears whenever they're playing. I also think it's worth pointing out, like, this season, oh, while we've only played, you know, nine games, I guess the Bears have played as of the recording of the Sunday evening, they've beat Stanford, a good Pac-12 team Stanford, by 40. They beat Arizona State by 12 in a tournament setting, right? They beat Michigan State by almost 20, okay? Today, they beat Villanova by almost 20, Right, uh, and then I guess next weekend they'll be facing Oregon after finals week's over. They get to go play Oregon in Eugene, and assuming they can pull that one off, they really will have gone undefeated through a tough non-conference schedule, and then head into play number currently number seventeen Iowa State to open up conference play in the new year. As I look at it, that non-conference slate is very very impressive. And they're currently undefeated and rolling, rolling through it. And so I look at Baylor as a team that looks like they've rolled over some returners into new roles. I mean, the most notable of which is LJ Cryer went from, I think he averaged three, three and a half points per game last year. He's getting 15 and a half to lead the team in scoring this season. Everyone remembers Matthew Meyer because of his funky haircut in the tournament last year. Uh, he's back for his senior year and is back, is averaging over 11 points per game. Again, even as memorable as his junior season was last year, he's only getting eight a game going in, you know throughout the year. Now, obviously, he had a great March, but he's picking up where he left off. That's impressive. James Akinjo transfers in from 
just, I believe it was Arizona last year. Yeah, Arizona last year, Georgetown before that. I guess at, at Arizona, he's a little more of a score, but here at Baylor, he's getting about 10 points a game and six assists a game, really dishing out well, playing very, very solid basketball. But again, across the board, if you look at this team, they're always going to be strong defensively. That's a Scott Drew staple. They're currently the second best defense and defensive rating, I guess in terms of defense rating, in all 358 college basketball teams. They're top six, I guess. I guess that's before the Villanova game, so maybe notes may change after that Villanova game that only allowed 37 points. Uh, they're you know, top six in points allowed per game. Uh, Scott Drew's really got it rolling there in Waco. And again, I, I think it's worth looking at this team because culture is king in college basketball and the Big 12 will battle test them. I mean, their schedule is no joke. The Big 12 has currently four ranked teams in it. I'd imagine you see one more jump in before the season's over. They currently have four ranked teams. Again, that's 40% of the conference is ranked. 30% is in the top 10 if you get after that. The one big non-conference fun game that you get to have if you're a Baylor fan is they play at Alabama. Number nine, Alabama should point out on January 29th. And as I look at this, I'm like, man, if Baylor can whether that sketch now I don't think they're going to feed it the whole season. I do think they'll go and defeat it in their non conference play after beating Villanova today, but I they won't be undefeated on the season. They'll lose a couple of these games. Like they might lose at Kansas or they might lose at Texas down the stretch at the end of the year or something like that. Uh, I, I don't think they're gonna lose to Iowa State to open it, but but we'll see. Uh, Alabama, like I mentioned, will be tough. If they lose one or two of those nail biters, that's fine because They'll end up winning the Big 12 tournament because they're Baylor and they will. And then they'll get a great seed and be top whatever and this, that, and the other. And they will be battle-tested after such a tough, tough schedule going into the conference, going to the March Madness tournament that I feel fairly confident in saying that they'll be ready. The The only thing holding back on this is that there are a couple other great college basketball programs out there. I mean, you have the Dukes and the UCLA's, the Gonzagas of the world are back in the top five. Uh, I think it's worth pointing out that, like, Gonzaga – Seems to be another monolith up there in the Northwest that's going to come wreck across the major landscape once the mid-major season's over for them. I also think it's worth pointing out that, you know, UCLA had their magical run last year, but they return a lot of guys, including Johnny Juzang, from a team that, had they not had COVID issues in the middle of the year last year that really threw them off middle of the Pac-12 season, might have been a much higher seed. And that Final Four appearance out of them might have been more emblematic of who they are than the seeding was ahead of time. And so I would keep an eye out for them. Also, whenever you have Paolo and Duke, you gotta go watch Paolo and Duke. And so I guess each of those kinds of things you could see potentially getting in Baylor's way, but Baylor's gonna be number one overall when the new rankings come out because they just beat Villanova and Purdue lost and so on. You're also gonna have Baylor going undefeated in a very difficult non-conference schedule. And again, I think the Big 12 conference schedule will be difficult, and I don't think they'll go undefeated in it, but I do think that's going to be impressive, and it's going to be interesting to watch those guys move. Again, go watch this team play. They play tremendous, tremendous defense. Like, I cannot stress the kind of work that Scott Drew's got those guys doing. So go watch Baylor. I think they're going to win another title this year. I certainly, if I'm going to my bookie, would not hesitate to put down some cash in them at plus 2100 that means you put down $100, you get $2,100 if they win the whole thing. And I'm telling you, I feel fairly good about them doing it. You just go to Sports, tell them we sent you, and you get a little bit extra cash on the side. All right. The fourth thesis for this week reads that Joe Brady should return to the NCAA and return to coaching college football. I'm going to sit at like a C plus on this one. I'm going to say like a C plus. <laughs> All right, so Joe Brady was just, uh, we'll say, relieved of his duties for the Carolina Panthers after being there for just two seasons as the Carolina Panthers' offensive coordinator. Worth pointing out, he had some very different quarterbacks to work with. He had Teddy Tuglos Bridgewater before. He had Sam Darnold to an extent this year, but then also had Cam Newton some this year. Had a lot of different offenses you're trying to run there, but in just two seasons, he's out as the offensive coordinator. You may remember him from LSU. He was the LSU passing game coordinator and wide receivers coach when they had their big run with Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, all those guys through a historic offensive season. He was the guy orchestrating all of that. Before that, 
He was an offensive assistant at, for the New Orleans Saints, just down the road from LSU, for a couple of years. Worth pointing out that he got to the New Orleans Saints after having just been a grad assistant at Penn State and a linebacker coach at William & Mary. He's really, really rapidly shot up the ranks. I mean, the guy is just 32, just turned 32 last September. He's already a professional level offensive coordinator that has been fired he's not getting his first job at 32 he's getting fired at 32 and that's impressive in and of itself reports indicate that he will want to stay in pro football now there are a number of different options obviously the new york giants have parted ways from jason garrett that could be a fun option uh, he also has a young quarterback there to work with you also have some draft capital it looks like they may end up with two top 10 picks this year and so Something fun to work with and build there in New York. Chicago Bears have figured out that they want to go with Justin Fields, but they had not figured out who they want to coach him. So theoretically, you could pull in Joe Brady to work with Justin Fields and run something fun and innovative for the young quarterback and create a new offense up there. It's also worth pointing out that, like, I don't know, like if Seattle really blows up, do you send him to Seattle? If the Dallas Cowboys miss the playoffs and they blow up their coaching staff, do you pull him into Dallas like with all the offensive weapons they've got? What do you do with all of that? And I think that those are all good options, but I want to go back to why I think he should be a college offensive coordinator for a second. In his brief stint in college, he helped lead an offense to 48.4 points per game with one of the most difficult schedules. I mean, I'm seeing one ranking of second, one ranking of third, one ranking of seventh, but one of the most difficult schedules in college football of any power five team, they went 15 and 0 and he had a high, he turned a guy that was a backup quarterback at Ohio state, helped develop him into a pro level quarterback and a Heisman trophy winner. Like, like I think it's worth pointing out how much success he had in such a brief run as a college offensive coordinator, as a college passing game coordinator that maybe he should look to that. I mean, his schemes and his passing influence and the way he utilizes speed seem in my mind, much more played towards college football than they are towards pro football. Because in college football, you could have a lot more of the equivalent of a number one pick whereas in the pros like the new york giants big sales pitch right now is that they have two top 10 picks next year but if you're the lsu tigers you could theoretically pull in 10 top 15 recruits for all we care right like, there's no limit on how many guys you pull in that are top whatever in their class Whereas there is that boundary in the pros. And the reason I think that plays to a Joe Brady offense is because of how much he utilizes speed. Well, if you're in the pros and everyone has speed, those concepts don't really work quite the same, right? You can't expect you just to have someone that they have to double cover because you're going to take the top off because the pro corners and safeties are faster and that speed is more evenly spread out. Like, obviously, yes, if you have Tyra Kill, that's one thing. That's speed that's not well spread out. But generally speaking, if you're in a 4-3, you're in the NFL as a corner DB safety. And if you're in a 4-6, you are not. Like, that's just how that goes. And I think that across the board, there's much more even playing field in regards to speed in the NFL. It comes a lot more down to strength. It comes a lot more down to precision and route running and those kind of things. That's why you see pro quarterbacks are throwing literal, it feels like darts on a dartboard from 60 and 70 yards away, right? That's the fun part to watch in pro quarterback play. But in college... Well, you can get so much more speed than everyone else. Clearly, that can help play a big advantage. And we've seen how that plays out with Joe Brady's offense. It looks like that Mario Cristobal is going to hire his wide receivers coach, Brian McClendon, to help run the offense down there in Miami. But, like, Joe Brady is from Miramar. He's just down the road. He understands the area. Could help recruit the state for sure. And on top of that, would run the kind of explosive, fun offense that we associate with the swagger of the Miami that they're trying to build back up. I think that'd be a really fun fit. There's a number of different other college options. For example, if that were to happen in Miami where Chris Ball brings down Brian McClendon, that's the current interim head coach at Oregon. So that would mean that the Oregon job is open. That means John, that Joe Brady could head that way. They could also use him back at LSU to help out with Brian Kelly and running that organization. I mean, obviously, it'd be a familiar face and would kind of help bring back some memories of the title that they just won a couple of seasons ago. 
out in LA. It looks like USC and Lincoln Riley are going to hold on to Dante Williams, but Williams himself is more of a defensive-minded coach, and so I don't know that Williams would be doing anything with the offense. I, I certainly imagine that there's some room for the flair of a Joe Brady offense in the City of Angels. I, I think that that could be a good pairing. I just see a number of different places that could use a Joe Brady on offense, and I think that that kind of a mind is still a college football type of mind in offense, not a pro football mind and type of offense, especially when I look at his pro career before LSU, because this Carolina thing has been so wonky. I don't know if it's really fair to judge him on that. But before LSU, yes, he was in the pros. He was at the New Orleans Saints, who historically have a creative offense with Sean Payton and rely on the arm of Drew Brees to run college-style types of concepts. I think that it's worth pointing out that that seems to be where his bread should be made, and I don't know why he's so focused on going pro. Now, what I will say is that I also gave this a C because I understand the desire to stay in pro football once you're there because you're not doing this recruiting thing for eight months out of the year where you're driving around to every single recruit's house and all over the state of Louisiana, the state of Florida, the state of California, wherever, wherever you're looking, trying to find people as much as you are working on coaching, 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 coaching. Yes, you have a scouting department. Yes, you work with them on scouting for the draft, but you are much more focused on coaching than you are on finding that talent to run the offense. And so I guess I understand why he might want to do that, but I really, really feel like his offense as a scheme is better suited for college ball. He says he wants to stay in the pros. We'll see how that works out for him. All right, so our fifth and final thesis reads, the Portland Trail Blazers should blow it up and restart. This thesis comes after a week that it feels like the Blazers were in the news a lot. I'm going to give this one a B plus. We're going to sit here at B plus on this one. Let's dive in. All right, so the Portland Trailblazers should blow up their team. And, and I gave that a B plus because I think there's a lot of positives. And so I want to look at what all they've got going. First, it's worth pointing out that Sage McCollum is out for an indefinite amount of time with a lung injury. You heard that correctly, a lung injury. And that is one that, I'm going to be honest, I think they should take as much time to bring that guy back as they need to. I mean, CJ McCollum is just 30 years old. Like, this is not some old man. Uh, he's got a lung problem. He could have another four or five good years in the league if he can breathe. That's when you think they need to make sure that he can breathe uh it also is worth pointing out that on a more like cutthroat level he probably needs to be able to breathe before he can actually be traded for something i think that's that's a fair assumption that a team bringing him in needs to know that he can breathe second i think that this stems from a lot of interest in what damian lillard could do elsewhere for whatever it's worth the portland trailblazers since getting dame lillard have lost in the first round of the nba playoffs five times have lost in the second round of the NBA playoffs another two times. And so that's uh, worth pointing out. They did get to a conference final one time. I would argue that that conference final they got to and then got swept in. They lucked out and being on the opposite side of the bracket from the from the Golden State Warriors would have gotten swept by them when they played because they got swept by them without Kevin Durant in that infamous playoff series back in 2019. So, eh, you know, yes, they got to a conference finals, but like, Man, they just changed coaches. They're now into Chauncey Billups after eight years in the entire Dame Lillard's career under Terry Stotts. And so it makes some sense to look at like, oh, if they're swapping coaches, maybe they need to start swapping rosters as well. I don't know if you want to necessarily follow that logic too much because I will say that if I had to swap coaches in a way to keep Dame Lillard, I might have done that earlier in his career. I mean, at this point, Lillard is 31 and a half. Uh, he's only got a few more years left, I would assume, of productive, high-level basketball in front of him. He has been All-NBA player six different times. He was a rookie of the year, his rookie year. He has been All-Star a handful of different times. But on the same or in the same breath, we need to point out that he hasn't been able to get past Steph Curry. He had troubles with, I mean, would you put him above the James Harden Rockets in that eight-year run? I mean, you know, would, he, would you put him above... Things like what LeBron's doing in LA, which you put him above the Durant and Westbrook Thunder teams. I mean, there's a number of different ways you can go. We hadn't even talked about Chris Paul is now running the 
Suns organization at a much older age. With he also has Devin Booker behind him. He's got DeAndre Aiden behind him. That team's going to be good for a little while. I just wonder how productive this team could be. So I want B plus because I see the positives in restarting the timeline and heading towards an NBA championship because there's a number of different top picks available. The Blazers themselves are currently ninth in the West. It wouldn't take a whole lot of losing. I mean, they're 11-15, so it wouldn't take a whole lot more losing to drop back several more spots very quickly. I also think it's worth pointing out that like, while Chauncey Billups doesn't want to go through a year or two of losing and then into a rebuild, I think he signed up to coach Dame Lillard. He ought to get a chance to coach Dame Lillard. It might be worth seeing what kind of guys he wants around his star. You know, they haven't been a whole lot of major roster replacement there in a while, and Billups deserves a chance to run the kind of roster he wants to run, and he kind of walked into this team as it stands. I just don't think the roster is very good. I think the roster's got a lot of good but not great players. I think Dame Lillard is like a tier two type of guard in the NBA, and that really just speaks to how talented the tier one is. Don't come after me on Twitter. I really just think that that's kind of where the guard position is, the scoring guard. I guess it's not really a shooting guard, not really a point guard, but the scoring guards are in the NBA right now. Seeing Jim McCollum is certainly a tier below that. And that's kind of where they get the bulk of their production from. Like, they they might get a night out of Robert Covington. They might get a night out of Nurkic. They might get a night out of, like, Dennis Smith Jr. is on the team right now. But, like, nah. You know, Larry Nance Jr. is on the team right now. But, like, nah. Right. Ant Simmons is, like, a freakish athlete, right? But and what else is he bringing to the table? I, I just, I look at their roster. And I'm like, eh, I don't, I don't know how much of these guys can really really produce on a championship or deep playoff run kind of team. And so I think that means it is probably time to blow it up. And I, I know that that's probably hard for Blazers fans to hear. They've fallen in love with Damian Lillard, but it's just run its course. It, it just, it just has. And I think it's worth it as a fan of his to send him somewhere where he can kind of ride out in the sunset on a championship caliber a team with a real chance to win at least or something like that i gave it a b plus and not a a plus because i do think it's worth pointing out that dame lillard will be successful and is a championship caliber type of guard if you give him the right pieces around him that's the way that is with any of these guards in basketball if you put them in the right situations they can win like yes steph curry is really really great but he's a lot better when he has Hall of Fame level Draymond Green, when he has Clay Thompson, when he has Kevin Durant, when he has Finals MVP Andre Iguodala, like those kinds of things make him a much better player. Not to mention the difference it made from going from Mark Jackson to Steve Kerr, right? Those kinds of things open up the floor for him in different ways. Yes, is Chris Paul a tremendous player? Absolutely. But we've seen what he does in Houston and in Phoenix when he has an all-star type of two guard next to him. Right, having someone running alongside him at the guard spot is tremendous for Chris Paul. Kyrie Irving, similar kind of vein. Is he a fun guard to watch? Is he good, shifty, fun? Makes a lot of points that yes, when he has that Durant or that LeBron next to him, man, he is unstoppable. When he's your two or your three, that is a tremendous, tremendous player. Kyle Lowry was the same kind of way, honestly. Like you watch the way Toronto played before going after Kawhi when Kyle Lowry was kind of the lead guy there. They're a great regular season team, but struggling in the playoffs. Get far, but close, but no cigar. But when you get him next to a guy like a Kawhi Leonard, man, that's a great basketball team. I think Dame Lillard could do that. And so I left some wiggle room there because if Portland wants to try and be the team that goes and gets that kind of a whale kind of prospect and brings them back to Portland, then power to him because I do see how he could be productive there and I guess if you thought you could pull that in you got to go try it I look at their roster and don't necessarily know what the the play is I, I don't think until you know more about CJ McCollum's health I don't imagine you can move him I don't know that they have other valuable assets I don't think a team in 2021 will look at Nurkic in the same kind of way as they might have 10 years ago and that's probably unfortunate the game just passed him by but he's really not the modern big man he's not the rim runner he's not the outside shooter he's not the pick and pop he he doesn't offer any of those elements and that's kind of where the game has headed do you take a flyer on greg brown the third do you take a flyer on quinn cook do you take i mean i don't guess he's even suited up for them this year he's just on the roster because he's got a contract do you take a, a flyer on ant simmons I, I don't i don't know who you take a flyer on this team i i just don't know 
how they would pull in that big whale. But I guess I need to leave some wiggle room because if Portland wants to bin, build that contender under Billups for Dame Lillard there, I can't tell them not to do that. I just don't know how it happens for them. I the Ben Simmons trade popped up on the informate popped up on all your ESPNs and stuff this week, right? Because the De- December fifteenth mark is coming up, and for those that are uninitiated, December fifteenth, you see a big jump in players available to be traded because all of those league new year deals that were signed in early july are eligible to be traded on december 15th so you go from like 60 percent of the league is eligible to be traded to like 90 percent of the league is eligible to be traded all at one time so you start to see a lot more player movement after december 15th looking at december 15th as like this potential marquee day to trade people we see and hear things like "Ooh, ben simmons is gonna get moved Ooh, what's gonna happen oh crazy all that kind of stuff and all that's fun I don't see a package that doesn't include Damian Lillard that Portland can realistically send off and bring Ben Simmons back, even including CJ McCollum, right? Even including CJ McCollum, I don't know. I mean, if you're Philly, I guess you're replacing a guy that's not playing with a guy that can play, and and I guess that's fine, assuming that, you know, knock on wood, all these things go well for CJ McCollum. But I don't I don't know that that's necessarily the haul they're going to want. I also think it's worth pointing out that, like, a guy that's clearly demonstrated he wants to use his own autonomy, said he wants to play on the West Coast. I don't think he meant the Northwest Coast. I, I think he meant California, and I think that's worth remembering for this guy who's clearly demonstrated he'll play when he wants to. I look at a number of different things and just feel like it is time for Portland to blow it up. I guess I got just left a little wiggle room just in case, but I think they got to blow it up. I think it's over. Sorry, Blazers. It's fun while it lasted. The league's more fun when the Blazers are in it because it's a great basketball atmosphere in the Northwest. But I just think this runs over. <laughs> Friends, that is another edition of FN Sports. Do you feel like you're all caught up on things in college football, pro football, college basketball, pro basketball, or whatever? If you enjoyed the show, be sure to download, rate, and review the show on all your audio mediums. And if you're finding us on YouTube or want to find us on YouTube, be sure to go check out the Six Pack Coverage Network on YouTube, you can find all kinds of fun shows like The Rookie and the Vet or Drew and Maul. There's Five for Fighting, which looks like a fun hockey podcast, too. If that's more your vibe, make sure you go subscribe to the Six Pack Coverage Network on YouTube. Six Pack Coverage Network on YouTube. You subscribe to one network, and it'll give you all updates on all of the shows. So be sure to go give them a subscribe. And on your audio mediums, make sure you download, subscribe, rate and review this show specifically as well. Go ahead and give it on a couple. Why not? More the merrier. As for our social media handles and updates on what all kind of things we're doing there, you can find us on Twitter at FN Sports 2. That's at F-I-N-S-P-O-R-T-S number two, all one word on Twitter. We're building up quite a following there. So make sure you go give us a follow. On Instagram, we're at F underscore N underscore sports. It's at F underscore N underscore sports. We're looking to build that one up as well. So be sure to go find us there and give us a follow. On each of those, if you follow links in the media handles, we'll find all our sponsors. So my bookie and Beard Struggle and Yeti and all those kinds of things. You'll also be able to find our merch store. We have a monthly charitable t-shirt. We're currently running a flunk hunger campaign for the holidays. So make sure you go find those. Grab yourself some merch, some swag, and represent FN Sports Podcast. Tell people you are not one to be flunked with. As for me, my personal stuff, you can find me at Painsworth512 on Twitter and Instagram. That's at P A I N S W R T H 512 on Twitter and Instagram. As always, I'll tell you all the kinds of things I'm doing, like podcasts I'm in, things I'm writing, lots of L's on sneakers. No, I did not get the cool grays. And no, I do not want to talk about not getting the cool grays. <laughs> I'll talk somewhat less depressedly so about my Texas Longhorns. Ah, eh, probably more depressed so about my Texas Longhorns. And then maybe a little bit less about my Houston Rockets. Spending when Jalen Green comes back, we'll see. Houston Rockets did have a great win streak, though, so that was a fun time to be on Rockets Twitter. But anyway, follow me on, at Painsworth512 on Twitter and Instagram. And again, wherever you are watching or listening to this, make sure you subscribe, make sure you download, make sure you rate, review, do all those wonderful things, do it multiple places if possible, multiple places if possible, and whatever you do, When it comes to sports, don't flunk with us. Later, guys.